CWI prep course, penetrant testing, PT, module 10, part five. Learning objectives. In this module, we're going to touch base on liquid penetrant testing, penetrant PT, six basic steps, and liquid penetrant equipment. Penetrant testing, PT. Liquid penetrant testing is a non-destructive method of detecting surface flaws in solid material and structures. Cracks, porosity, gouges, laps, seams, and other types of flaws can be found using this technique. Penetrant testing is a process in which the liquid penetrant is drawn into small openings by capillary action when it is applied to a surface. After a specified time, excess penetrant is removed from the surface and developer is applied to the surface. The developer absorbs residual penetrant from the flaw leaving a bright colored penetrant bleeding through the developer's white background giving a clear visual indication of cracks, porosity, or other flaws. This is a surface technique. It'll find subsurface defects that break into the surface, but if you have a crack that doesn't break to the surface, you're not going to find it with dye penetrant. Here's a couple examples and kind of a quick overview of where we're going to go. We're going to get into a little more depth. Liquid penetrant testing, PT. Um, steps in PT procedure, clean and dry component, apply penetrant, remove excess, apply developer, visual inspection, and then post clean the component. Advantages, portable and easy to use, surface breaking defects only. Liquid penetrant inspection PT is used to inspect metals for surface defects similar to those revealed by MT inspection. Unlike MT inspection, which can reveal subsurface defects, the PT inspection reveals only those defects that are open to the surface. Both ferrous and non-ferrous metals can be inspected by the use of PT inspection. Here's the basic rundown, the principles. A, you spray the penetrant on the surface. It seeps into the crack. B, cleaning removes the penetrant from the surface but not from the crack. C, you spray on the developer. It draws the penetrant from the crack. The liquid penetrant inspection process consists of six steps, each involving a specific penetrant product. You've got the pre-cleaning, the surface cleaning. Number two, penetrant application. Three, penetrant removal. Four, developer application. Five, examination and inspection. Six, post cleaning of the part. I know I'm beating a dead horse here on our six basic steps, but you're going to get your money's worth on penetrant. Um, first picture, you clean it. Second, step two, you apply the penetrant. See how nothing's soaked into the crack or the defect there? Three, you wait. See how it's seeping into the crack there? Four, you remove the excess penetrant. The penetrant's gone from the surface, but it's still in the defect. You apply the developer, then you wait. Then you see how the dye from the penetrant soaks out to the surface and you've got that contrast between what the dye is that was in the crack and what was on the surface. This is dye penetrant. The six basic steps of liquid penetrant testing. The surf, step one, the surface to be inspected must be cleaned in such a way that the surface flaws present will be free of dirt, water, grease, or other foreign matter that would interfere with the penetrant entering each flaw. Step two, the penetrant can be applied by any one of several means. It can be sprayed, applied by brush, rags, or mops, or by completely dipping or submerging the part in a vat containing the penetrant. The important point is that the penetrant must cover the entire surface to be inspected. Step three, after the liquid penetrant has been applied, sufficient time must be given to allow the penetrant to enter any flaws that are present. This is called the dwell time. 
The dwell time required varies with the type of penetrant, the size and type of the flaws. Step four, after the penetrant has entered all the exposed flaws, then the penetrant that remains on the surface must be removed. This is often referred to as the washing of the part. It may be as complicated as an actual washing or spraying of the part with a cleansing liquid or as simple as wiping the part clean with a solvent moistened rag. The guide to a proper cleaning involves two considerations. The cleaning must be adequate to remove the penetrant from the portion of the surface that is free of flaws, otherwise a loss of contrast between the indications of defects and the background will result, but not so extensive that the penetrant is removed from the flaws to be detected. Step 5. Once the excess penetrant is removed, and where required, the surface is dried, a developer is equally applied. The developer can be applied as a spray. It is important that the developer is not applied too thickly, a thin uniform layer being desired. The developer accomplishes two basic tasks. It provides a contrasting background so that the penetrant can easily be seen or detected. Therefore, the penetrant normally, a very deep bright color, would require the developer to be white powder or other contrasting color. The developer also acts as a sponge or absorber of the penetrant so that it draws the penetrant out of the flaws and spreads it into a region on the surface large enough to be seen. Step 6. After the developer is applied, time must be allowed for the penetrant to be drawn out of the flaws by the developer. Normally, the longer this waiting time, the greater will be the indications. Long waiting times will, however, result in the greatest difference between the shape of the indications and the shape of the actual flaws, and may sometimes, therefore, be undesirable. Too long a waiting time can also allow indications to run together to give the appearance of one large flaw when several separate flaws might actually exist. Penetrant inspectors should be qualified and certified in accordance with SNTTC1A or a similar document. To provide permanent records, photographs of the specimen should be taken prior to post-cleaning. Post-cleaning is only required for those specimens that are found free of defects. Defects are described by engineering documents or in contract codes and specifications. Post-inspection cleaning is necessary since the penetrant and developer residue tend to attract moisture, which can cause corrosion or can interfere with subsequent processing or usage. The cleaning methods for post-inspection cleaning are generally the same as those recommended for the pre-cleaning process. So this is just telling us, hey, the penetrant inspectors, they need to be qualified. You need to have paperwork on them. SNTTC1A is a great document to provide guidance in how to qualify non-destructive testing personnel. And then you want to make sure and provide permanent records that you did an inspection. And in this day and age, it's photographs generally from a, you know, a cell phone or a small digital camera. You know, stash those on a hard drive of a computer or a server somewhere and then you clean the thing you disposition the part and then like I said you did the the post inspection cleaning and then you're on about your business to the next part visual detection the ultimate success of liquid penetrant testing is the ability of the eye to discern an indication based upon the contrast between normal areas of a developer with an area that has absorbed penetrant. The ability of the eye to accomplish this will depend upon the total area over which this differentiation exists. The sharpness of the edges, the degree of contrast, the efficiency of any contained phosphors, and the illumination available. In order to increase the detection ability, some penetrants are made to be fluorescent. This effort to be successful 
must then include an adequate darkroom and ultraviolet light sources that can establish the fluorescence. A fluorescent contrast under proper conditions can be much greater than the contrast obtained under normal lighting. Therefore, understanding the physics of human visual requirements, proper eye accommodations for darkroom viewing, and measuring the output of ultraviolet lights all become important in liquid penetrant inspection when fluorescent penetrants are used. Fluorescent liquid penetrants have been developed to be more sensitive than dye penetrants to the presence of small flaws. As a result, fluorescent penetrants are more popular than dye penetrants. It must constantly be kept in mind that there are differences in visual acuities for different individuals for different situations, and all these differences must be considered in assessing the acceptability of any of these inspection methods or procedures. The equipment used in liquid penetrant testing ranges from simple to fully automatic systems and varies in size, layout, and arrangement depending on the requirements of the specific tests. The size of the equipment used is largely dependent on the size and types of articles to be tested. The layout of the equipment, i.e. whether it's in a U, an L, or a straight line, is determined by the facilities available, the production rate, and the required ease of handling. The number of stations is dependent on the process used. When testing is required at a location remote from stationary equipment, or when only a small portion of a large specimen require tests, portable liquid penetrant kits are used. Both fluorescent and visible dye penetrants are available in kits. The penetrant materials are usually dispensed from pressurized spray cans or applied by brush. Here's an LP inspection station. Um, this would be, you'd set something like this up if you were going to be doing a lot of parts over and over and over. You know, some kind of production situation. I worked in a foundry where they had something similar to this, but it was much it was much larger, but they had black lights and you know a draining station and it's for doing parts the size of a Volkswagen. They didn't you know break out five hundred and twelve cans of dye penetrant and spray it on the part and then hit it with the you know the developer they had stations set up and this is one of many possible you know configurations for LP inspection stations you know a cabinet situation like this where you've got some sinks and um, you know some cabinets and then you've got the black light inspection station like a booth where you can close it off and it's absolutely dark in there and you can Hit it with a hit the part with the black light and see if any uh, any From the previous slide, you can see how there might need to be some auxiliary equipment. Certain auxiliary equipment is often located at the penetrant test stations. The auxiliary equipment may in some instances be built in at one or more of the stations. Pumps, various pumps installed at the penetrant emulsifier rinse and developer stations are used to agitate the solutions to pump drain off material into the proper tank for reuse and to power handheld sprayers and applicators. Sprayers and applicators. Sprayers and applicators are frequently installed at the penetrant emulsifier rinse and developer stations. They decrease test time by permitting rapid and even application of penetrant materials and water rinses. Both conventional and electrostatic sprayers are used. Lights. White lights as well as black lights are installed as required to ensure adequate and correct lighting at all stations. 
When fluorescent materials are used, black light is installed at both the rinse and inspection zones. Timers. One or more 60-minute timer with alarms are used to control penetrant emulsifier developing and drying cycles. Thermostats and thermometers. These are items that are required and used to control the temperature of the drying ovens and penetrant materials. Exhaust fans are installed and used when testing is performed in closed areas. The fans facilitate removal of fumes and dust. Hydrometers. Hydrometers are used to measure the specific gravity of water-based wet developers. The hydrometer used in liquid penetrant testing are floating type instruments.